Branded Product Placement. Branded Product Placement is the paid appearance of a branded product or logo in any type of media to gain exposure for the brand. This could be broadcast programming, movies, music, video games, books, and so have you. Just keep in mind that paid appearance could be barter agreements where a brand appears in a show and the show provides other things besides money. So that fits into the paid appearance. Then you have branded product integration. This is when a brand is actually written to the script or the lyrics and this can be any media as well. So we're thinking about music lyrics or the script in a movie or a show or a sitcom. And then the last term, branded digital product placement or branded digital integration. This is the post-production integration of a brand images into existing video programming. And this is any media as well. So you have branded product placement, branded integration, branded digital product placement, and branded digital integration. So many people believe that branded product placement started with the placement of Reese's Pieces in the E.T. movie in 1982. And this movie was a big hit and in a scene, Elliot lured E.T., the alien, into his home with a trail of Reese's Pieces. In order to use Reese's Pieces candy in the movie, Hershey's, the parent company of Reese's, agreed to spend $1 million over a six-week period promoting the movie in exchange for the rights to use E.T. in its ads. The product placement paid off for Reese's. Sales for the candy went up 80% and the $1 million investment resulted in 15 to $20 million worth of promotion for the brand. Unfortunately for Eminem, they turned down the offer. They were quoted as saying they didn't think it was a worthwhile movie and they did not want their brand to be associated with an ugly creature. So although this was a hit for branded product placement, this is not where it started. Branded product placement started way back in the early days of media. So the first recognizable product placement having a direct impact on sales was both unintentional and negative for the undershirt t-shirt industry. So men wore t-shirts under their shirts, but not the cool Clark Gable. In the 1938 film, Happened One Night with Clark Gable, he took off his shirt, stood bare chested, and the results was the plummeting of undershirt sales in the US. And this was important because he was a sex figure. All the men wanted to be like him. All the women loved him. So he was a big influence. Um, if Clark Gable isn't wearing t-shirts, then why should we? And so it did not change until the 50s when James Dean and Marlon Brando um, the new sex symbols rode in on their Harleys and t-shirts that undershirt sales began to rise again. So now it's cool again to wear t-shirts um, and so the sales began to take off and go back up again. So this is a good example of the message objective where you're using a celebrity to promote a brand. Here is an example of branded placement and branded integration. In the fall of 2013, the Branded Entertainment Network team was challenged to find content that would help promote the release of the new Xbox One. They wanted to raise awareness and target a younger audience. The Branded Entertainment Network learned of an upcoming script of The Big Bang Theory with Dr. Sheldon Cooper choosing a new video game system. 
The Big Bang Theory was one of the biggest globally recognized shows and the perfect production to promote the brand because the main characters often spoke about science, technology, and gaming. Here's a five minute clip from that episode. First there was PlayStation, AKA PS1. Then there's PS2, PS3, and now PS4. And that makes sense. You'd think after Xbox, there'd be Xbox 2, but no. Next came Xbox 360. Hmm? And now, after 360, comes Xbox One. Why one? Maybe that's how many seconds of thought they put into naming it. Can you get the butter, please? Yeah. However, with the Xbox One, I can control my entire entertainment system using voice commands. Up until now, I've had to use Leonard. Then get the other one. Pass the butter. Get, hang on. I don't feel like you're taking this dilemma seriously. Fine, Sheldon. You have my undivided attention. Okay, now, the PS4 is more angular and sleek looking. No way! You, it's true, but the larger size of the Xbox One may keep it from overheating. Well, you wouldn't want your gaming system to overheat? No, see, well, you absolutely would not. And furthermore, the Xbox One now comes with a Kinect included. Included? Yes! <laughs> not sold separately. You, although the PS4 uses cool new GDDR5 RAM, while the Xbox One is still using the conventional DDR3 memory. Why would they still be using DDR3? Are they nuts? You, <laughs> see, that's what I thought. But then they go and throw in an ES RAM buffer. Oh, wait, wait a second. Who's they? The Xbox. You're kidding! No, I am not. And this ES RAM buffer should totally bridge the 100 gigabit per second bandwidth gap between the two RAM types. This is a nightmare. How will you ever make a decision? See, I don't know. What should I do? Please pass the butter! I'm proud of you, Sheldon. You know, I'm proud of me, too. I've done all my research, I conducted an informal poll, and I've arrived at the rock-solid certainty I've made the right choice. Well, that's got to be a good feeling. Oh, it is. Although... Oh, crap. <laughs> you now, I had the same feeling when I made my dad buy a Betamax instead of a VHS. You were just a little kid. Yeah, a little kid who picked the wrong format to record the McNeil Lara report. <laughs> Now, I also was certain that HD DVD would win out over Blu-ray. How old were you then? Old enough to know better. <laughs> you know, and now that I think about it, I stood in front of a case of iPods and I bought a Zune. <laughs> What's a Zune? Yep, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's an MP3 player brought to us by the makers of Xbox. <laughs> What are you doing? No, oh, pick that back up. You know it's good. You did the research. But what if I'm wrong? You know what? How about I buy it for you? How about I buy you both? <laughs> you know I only have one slot available on my entertainment center. Then I'll buy you a new entertainment center. Oh, yeah, okay, sure. But which one? <laughs> how about this? I've heard that if you flip a coin, it will tell you how you actually feel, because you'll either be disappointed or excited by the outcome. Interesting. So, heads, it's PS4, tails, it's Xbox One. All right, I'll try. What is it? A quarter. <laughs> Could have given it back to me. That was a choice. On the one hand, the Xbox One has a better camera, but the PS4 has a removable hard drive. Thoughts? I can't feel my legs. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, guys, but the store closed five minutes ago. But I haven't decided yet. You have to come back tomorrow. The registers are closed. <laughs> well, let's get you some food. You you'll feel better after you eat. Okay. What, what do you want? Like Thai food, uh, a burger? Uh, I don't know! <laughs> I want a quarter! <laughs> Although the
this may seem obvious that it's branded product placement, it's not to the average person because it's written into the script so well and it goes so well with the characters, it seems realistic. And this is one of the things that product placement aims to do, is to seem very realistic and very subtle, although this wasn't subtle, um, it was realistic. The results of this placement resulted in 17.6 million brand impressions. That's the total number of exposures to your advertisement. It generated a media value of over 10 million. They had 10 times more daily Twitter mentions. And the research group simply measured also tracked a 334% spike in Twitter chatter about the Xbox One following this placement. Here are examples of placements with Apple. Um, some of these may be integrations, but some of them not. They're just placements. So, for example, in the top left, you have The Office, which is a sitcom. In the middle, on the left, The Intern, which is a movie. And then at the bottom, on the left, Modern Family, which is a sitcom. Now, Modern Family here were advertising their group FaceTime. So this is when they first made it so more than one person can be on FaceTime. So the whole family pretty much were on FaceTime and this is the whole episode pretty much. And then on the right, you have a drama series, House, um, even in cartoons, this is South Park. And the whole episode was about choosing an iPad. And then at the bottom, you have the Colbert Report, which is comedy news. So Apple reportedly doesn't pay to have its products featured, but will send plenty of Apple freebies to production companies to have their brand included in scenes. Here on this slide features Coke. Um, so Coke sponsored American Idol for 13 years. The initial deal in 2002 was for $10 million. By 2008, it had jumped to $35 million. At the time, Pe Pepsi had just won the NFL rights over Coke and was successfully targeting younger customers by using pop stars like Britney Spears to promote their brand. Then Pepsi passed up the opportunity to sponsor American Idol in its first season, and Coke jumped at the opportunity. If you look at the images, the top left, you see the judges, and they all have big Coke um, plastic cups in front of them. The one in the middle is the red room, um, like the green room, the traditional green room, the waiting room for like the actors between scenes and things of that nature. They called it the red room. And if you can look through it, you see Coke is everywhere. Even the couch has the Coca-Cola um, swoosh on it and everything is red. In the bottom um, left one is the American Idol Lounge. So everything is dolled up with Coke. Um, and then we have Coke on the Netflix series Stranger Things. So started with the third season, Coke partnered with Stranger Things to bring back the new Coke from 1985. If you remember, the new Coke was the biggest marketing failure in history. When Coke changed its formula, this resulted in a huge backlash. According to Netflix, and I quote, none of the brands and products that appear in Stranger Things were paid for or placed by third parties. They are all part of telling the story that references 1980s pop culture, but most likely, Coke agreed to dedicate significant resources into promoting the partnership, which in turn builds a brand awareness. So if you look at the images, um, in the top one, you see the character is drinking Coke. Um, you can see Coke clearly. In the middle one, you see the character 11. Um, in this scene, she actually crashes the 
Hope can with her mind. And this was actually from season one, but the deal didn't come through until season three. And then in the last um, image on the bottom right, you see that she's drinking a Coke and you can see the logo says the new Coke. And so Coke has made a limited number of these new Cokes with that old formula. Um, they say they don't, they don't expect to make any money for, from it. It's just mostly novelty. Um, and so there you have it with Coke. This next slide, just look at it for a few minutes. Um, each of the images from TV shows or movies notice anything missing so in the top left one you'll see public phone so although you hardly even see pay phones anymore most pay phones or all pay phones had a company logo on it so it might be like virginia bell or at&t or something like that but it just says public phone and then you look to the right you have um, a person in a scene where a uh, post-it is covering up the logo. And the same in the bottom right where you have the character is on obviously an Apple computer, but the logo is covered up. And to the left in this scene, um, very interesting, is the vending machine behind the character. All of the candy bars are turned around so you don't get to see what they are so in this case there were no placements or they couldn't get um, brands to team up with them or the deal wasn't working because of the money or things of that nature and so they didn't want to give free promotion to a brand also you'll notice um, in the last few years that there are a lot of fake brands in um, TV shows and movies. And in this case, um, these companies make up fake brands instead of using real brands, where it still looks authentic. However, it's not a real brand and there's no promotion deals or anything like that. In this next slide, this is an example of digital product placement. In April 2005, Club Crackers was digitally inserted into an episode of Yes Dear for about 20 seconds. So you can see the before on the left. And on the right, you have the green Club Crackers box. And that was inserted after the show was produced. So that's the post-production. And that's the first time that um, a brand was digitally altered to superimpose the brand image. Two more examples here. How I Met Your Mother at the bottom left. You see the before and then you see the after where Gatorade was added to the scene. And the same sitcom you see in the original production, Pizza Hut was added to the scene. And so these offer opportunities um, that are not available when you're not digitally placing the brand. And we'll talk about that in this next slide. So here are some opportunities that are advantages for branded product placement and integration. It cannot be avoided by the viewer unless you leave the program. So if you're watching Stranger Things and somebody's drinking a Coke, you're not going to get up and walk away as you would a 30-second TV ad. You might get up and go to the bathroom or start texting or something of that nature. As long as it's subtle and not interfere with the program, research has shown that it is very effective. Family sitcoms are ideal because they often take places in take place in kitchens and things of that nature where you have a lot of brands around. Reality TV shows are ideal because 
they appear to be genuine. So if your favorite reality TV show is drinking Coke, you may think that they're drinking Coke because they like Coke and not because they're promoting Coke. And then with the digital, you have targeted demographics. And what I mean by that is I might see it on the West Coast and instead of it being a Coke, it's a Sprite or a Pepsi. And then on the East Coast, they might see Dr. Pepper or something else. So you can target locations, geographic, demographics. Another thing that um, production companies are doing when you have, say, it's a movie that comes out and they're using Sprite. And then through when it's released on the DVD, instead of Sprite, they have imposed um, Dr. Pepper. And so that would indicate that Sprite still was for the movie, but not for the DVD release. So now they can play around with different um, um, partnerships and ideally make more money. It's even been said that old TV shows that were out in the um, 70s and 80s, that they're imposing brands or um, products that wasn't there at first, like in the Yes Dear um, scene. Okay, then you have some challenges. So some of the challenges may be actors may want comp compensation. So an actor is being paid to advertise a 30 second TV commercial. So sh why shouldn't they get paid to be advertising the brand and branded product placement? It can be a conflict between the brand product placement and the actor endorsed brand. So if I'm an actor, I'm a famous actor, and I'm endorsing Pepsi, I can't be on a sitcom and drinking Coke. That's a conflict of interest there. And then the last one, product placement of one brand in a 30-second commercial and a competitor's brand within the branded product placement. So if you have made a deal with Pepsi to be the brand that's placed in the TV show, the network wouldn't be able to sell a 30 second show to Coke unless Pepsi was okay with it. So that is an overview of branded product placement or branded entertainment.